Our Gospel reading on this Christ the King Day is from the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, and it's in the 18th chapter. And you have to kind of put it in context. Jesus has had a phenomenal impact in ministry for three years, and then it all caved in because of power struggles and so forth. He uh, was arrested. He was abused through the night by the chief priests and their group. And uh, then he was brought to Pontius Pilate, who represented all the power of the state. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas, the high priest, over to Pontius Pilate's headquarters. It was very early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters. So Pilate went into them and said, What is your accusation against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. So Pilate entered the headquarters again, and he summoned Jesus to himself. And he asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate said, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? But Jesus answered him calmly, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered him, You say that I am. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth will listen to my voice. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So this week I googled a question, how long can I expect to live? So a website came up, one of the first ones said, good news, medical advancements have increased your longevity. Use this handy calculator to determine exactly what year will be your last year. Thank you. <laughs> No, I don't think so. So, guess who sponsored this website, do you think, about longevity? A, Wisconsin Memorial Park. B, Mutual of Omaha Insurance. C, my children. <laughs> How long do we expect to live? Do you know, in the United States, they say right now, the average longevity is 77.7 .7 years. But if you make it to 65, then the likelihood, they say, is that you can add another 18 years and more so that you'll live into your late 80s, into your 90s, even into your hundreds. If you, how many of you have met somebody who's 100 years old? It's going on more than you know. So at this nursing home uh, that where I preached, the lady in the front was Frida. Did I tell you about her? 105. And I said, Frida, that's amazing. She says, well, you should see my friend. She's in the back row. She just turned 109. Wow. Both of them women. <laughs> well, I, well, well I don't, I'm not going there. <laughs> that's amazing, isn't it? So how long do you think you're going to go? Maybe you'll go into your 80s, 90s, 100s. Maybe you'll press the world record right now. The oldest living person in the world was a woman who lived... This is not in the Bible, though. There's longer ones there. But she lived to be 122 years old. You know, I wonder what it's like to go that long, whether it feels way too long, or I have a feeling that with older people I meet, they tend to say, how did I get here? Life is really short. So I want to talk with you today on this wind-up message for Believing is Seeing. Talk to you about planning to live forever. 
planning to live forever. And how does that change your approach to life? Really, for believing people, we have certain advantages. We are going to walk through the same tough stuff other people do, the same kind of great losses, you know, bad disappointments and, and griefs that are going on. Some of you are here today to honor a big sorrow that's going on in your life and uh, seeking grace for that. We're praying for you. We Christians have all that same stuff, but we have some things that go with us. We have some advantages that help us out because we do not just live by what we see in the physical world. We know that there's more going on than meets the eye. There is a whole another realm we call spiritual, or more powerful, much more powerful dominion, spirituality. And because we're aware of that and we know that, it gives us a kind of help to take us through the tough stuff. It's an aid in our corner. And so we live by this scripture passage. Let's read it together. We walk by faith, not by sight. That brings us benefits. Really, it, it helps us as believing people. Believing is seeing. And I'm going to talk about three advantages I think we get from our faith. The first one is knowing, knowing that God's kingdom, though hidden, is always at work. So Pontius Pilate had this amazing power, you know, the emblem of the, of the Roman Empire. It was the massive power of the day, and he read that in Israel. When we were in Israel touring a few weeks ago, we came to Caesarea, and it's uh, a place that they unearthed not that many years ago. It's a huge, giant playground for Pontius Pilate and his powerful friends, including a giant amphitheater uh, right on the sea, and then behind it is a huge racetrack and an area where they would hold competitions and so forth. And it just kind of dripped in wealth. They have all of that, and yet all that power seems to breed anxiety. There's a sense of worry about threats out there that could maybe crumble all of this. And so Pontius Pilate, he asks Jesus after being abused, this poor, pathetic-looking person from Nazareth, are you the king of the... He was incredulous. Jesus very calmly answers him, I am a king, but my kingdom is not from this world. Well, again, Pilate said, don't you understand who I am? That I have the authority to either release you or to crucify you to death. Once again comes Jesus' calm reply. You have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that there is another power, a far greater power, a supreme power, that is the Lord God, the King and Creator of all things and all the universe, and there is the source of His power. So why should he ever be afraid? He knows that this king of kings, by just a flick of the hand, could demolish anything any human people ever built in a moment. In fact, it's happened in the course of history. And what if this ruler, this grand king on his throne, is your father? then you have an advantage. Sure, there are forces that come against you in life, threats that come against you, maybe to your health, threats to your finances, maybe threats to your family, threats even to your church. But when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is your Father, you're good. Because all those forces come against you, there is a greater, greater, all-surpassing force that is coming for you and is working in your behalf. So Jesus, standing there in chains, abused, mocked, about to be killed, knew that his heavenly Father was fighting for him. 
And so it was just a matter of time. Victory is coming in. And it gave him strength. Believing is seeing. And that's the second great advantage of our faith, is we rely on God's strength, not our puny strength. When you believe, you don't have to go around getting through all the really tough, hard things on your own little strength. You are wired to a source of power and strength and help far beyond your own natural capabilities. Jesus knew that. He knew that his Father, the creator of all, was working in him and through him, and so anything was possible. He could face the darkest, worst powers and forces against him because he knew this greater, all-surpassing power was in his favor. And so Jesus, in the same Gospel of John, he's always talking about the Father of everything, his Father, God. He goes, my Father is working as I am. He means constantly through him. He says, it is my Father who honors me. I'm not worried about a Pontius Pilate. You know. He says, my Father loves me. There's the source of strength. So even though he knows his Father sent him on this incredible mission to rescue the world, and it would include a cross, a crucifixion in his story on earth, even though that can trouble his soul, he finds great strength and comfort in trusting that his father can even take a cross and turn it into a throne. You know, of the four Gospels, John's Gospel is the one that, that turns the cross into a victory. It's like Jesus is reigning from the cross. It's already begun, the kingdom of grace through him, arrived on earth through the cross. He says, when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all people to himself. So he is establishing a kingdom that is from everlasting to everlasting through the Father's plan for his life. Now listen to this. He goes on to say something really important for you to hear today. He says, the Father, I am in the Father, Father's in me, and you in me, and I in you. Who can understand that? He's telling us that the power of the Lord, the King, is inside of us. That he lives in us and through us always. That means that when you come up against your Pontius Pilate, you have a strength available to you if you'll go there. The king of the universe lives in you. And you are stronger knowing that this king got hold of your hand. He takes your hand and he's going to walk you through the loss of that loved one. He's going to walk you through the issue with your family. He's going to walk you through the loss of your job. The king of the universe will take your hand and walk you through that divorce. Take you right through that bad diagnosis through the long treatment. When the king of the universe takes your hand, he can walk you through and past addictions. And he can get you through things that just scare out of you because you're so afraid for a loved one. In your strength, you're going to feel often quite weak. I know I do. And very helpless at many times in the journey. But in the strength of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who's been there and risen, you will not fail. You cannot fail. It's impossible. You have the Lord God fighting your fights. How can I be so sure of this? Well, it's another benefit of faith, I believe, is there. It's the third advantage that we have by faith in God. It's faith in God's sure plan for victory. God has a plan for the whole universe to gather up all the broken pieces, restore everything, and your life. So Jesus could punch his pilot, the rejection of the people, the misery and embarrassment of the cross. He could do that because of one thing. He believed 
God had destined him for victory. Do you believe God has destined you for victory? If you know that deep in your heart, you know, that the plan is in place, whatever you see with your eyes, and you trust that, it's going to release your life. Jesus also said in John, If you loved me, you would rejoice that I said I am going to the Father. Because going to the Father and leaving this kingdom is taking us to another that's far superior, even eternal. That's victory. That's the victory of our God. Nobody can take it. If you believe that's your destiny, what? You know, going to Israel, you, you saw all sorts of things, ancient things in this holy land. Thank God we're getting in a time of, of truce between the violence going on there between peoples. But, um, you know, God answers prayers. We've been praying heartily that there would be an end to that violence, and not just us, but thousands, millions of people praying for that. And I believe those prayers have power to bring the kingdom of peace into kingdoms of warfare. But while we were there, I became impressed with, you know, all the archaeologists are constantly digging another layer, 30 feet down more, 30 feet down more, 30 feet down more, and every time you find a whole history, a century of history, there's another century of history, and most of it is a record of great superpowers marching their way through the Holy Land and stomping on everything in sight. So it's leveled, and then it's rebuilt again by God's help and grace, and then it's leveled again, you know. Uh, but the people persevere, the people of God. And one time, a great prophet by the name of Isaiah declared victory in advance of a war. And they had the Assyrian army, which was the most massively built up military operation of that day, sitting on the edge, ready to come in and destroy them. And yet, in the face of that, this was what the prophet declared. He said, the Lord of hosts, who are the hosts? They're the mighty angels of the kingdom. The Lord of hosts has planned it, has planned this. So who can cancel it? He's talking about victory. When he, the Lord of hosts, stretches out his hand, who can stop it? I love that. It's like God has a victory plan in the works for every one of his children. Nobody can stop it. When he reaches out his hand, it's going to be. So if you're God's child, I'd say to you, whatever you got cooking that you can see with your eyes in the physical world, stay in faith. Keep the faith. Hang in there. We have people here today hurting in our family. And uh, we, we love you. We want you to know that, and we're praying for your comfort and peace. We want to encourage you as well with hope. We should be encouraging one another all the time. So we're up against a lot. We should say to one another, stay in faith. Hang in there. So today, here I'll raise a couple of situations. I'll say, stay in faith, and you whisper to one another, hang in there. Let's try it once. Stay in faith. For every loss, there will be a gain. Stay in faith. For every setback, there will be a comeback. Stay in faith. And in that lonely night when the ache of your grief is really, really, really too much to bear, just stay in faith. Victory is coming. Because Easter came, no matter what, in life and in death, we can know that victory is on the way. God's powerful kingdom has already broken into this world. All our enemies seriously are falling for us, whether they know it or not. 
restoration is coming. The answer to your deepest prayers right now is in the works. It is coming in. The dark, threatening powers giving way to the dawning light of God's triumphant day of victory. It's coming. So, yes, weep. Struggle, okay. Worry, not so much. Have your doubts if you must. But why not just trust? Live trusting that you know how all this turns out. So I called Pastor Steve on Monday. I said, Steve, what are you doing? And he said, on Monday, I'm, I'm watching the Packer game. The Packer game? That was yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching it now. I recorded it. Oh, do you know how it turns out? I said. <laughs> and he said, I do. They won. So you're watching it knowing that, yeah, this is my favorite way to watch the game. Knowing that they won, then I watch the game, and I don't care if they fumble, if the pass is intercepted, bad things happen, no problem. I just relax because I know they triumphed. <laughs> I love that. So why don't we live that way? We know how the game turns out. So let's just relax, believe, trust God. Amen. Now we're going to remember the saints among us who are in glory. Virginia V. Joliet. The youngest of 14 children, Virginia grew up learning survival skills, one of which was her great sense of humor. She and her husband Jim managed the Picks and Park theaters in Waukesha. They loved big band music, dancing, and they knew Les Paul and Mary Ford. After years of enjoying life in Florida, Virginia moved to Linden Court in Waukesha and enjoyed Pastor Frank's monthly gigs there, singing songs from Blackbird to Beautiful Savior. Baptized Catholic, turned Episcopal, and buried Lutheran, Virginia entered glory with all her bases covered. Grace Margaret Poth. Hers was a well-lived life of 93 years, receiving grace after grace. Two things she loved deeply. Her family of seven children, 19 grandchildren, 30 great-grandchildren, and 14 great-great-grandchildren. All of their pictures plus their spouses, covered an entire wall. And Grace loved Ascension Church, its festival music, the celebration band, puppets, pastors, friends, and our parish nurses. She was featured in a hospital video once. At age 10, Grace's mother had died, and she was placed in an orphanage. Tough as it was, just as in other difficult times, she simply said, the good Lord will provide. This faith saw her losing her husband Harold, surviving cancer, and dealing with the challenges of aging. At the end, she bathed, dressed, got her hair done, and from her bed held her hands up and called out, Harold, and soon went to Jesus. Violet Tinus. Like the color purple, Violet was both warm and cool. Anyone who met her got that warm, inviting smile. She was born smiling. In life, this lady named warmed her family of five generations. 
At age 96, she knew all their names and their spouses' names, all her nieces and nephews, and sent each of them birthday cards. She was also a special grandma to Eric Hosel. Her hospitality to shine to all shined out for 30 years as a waitress at Avalon Manor and at Ascension as a greeter. Violet was also cool. She loved to polka. She even got Pastor Frank to try it once. She loved parties, baseball, football, casinos, winning, and shopping at Kohl's. Vi loved God's word, worship, communion, and church. All the fruits of the Spirit, love, peace, described Nana Vi. And now Violet, the color of royalty, adds joy in heaven's kingdom. Chuck Hoyer, the only child of German immigrants, Carl learned from them how to let go, to leave a homeland, to believe that not everything is as it seems, and that there are beginnings in our endings Carl had love and passion for many aspects of life, and in later years, for a beloved pet rabbit. He found fulfillment and purpose in his many projects, in solving problems with woodworking and photography. As his eyesight declined, he learned to see in the moment, from, and he talked about what he saw from the inside. Carl believed life was good and it was to be enjoyed. His faith told him there's always more than meets the eye. Now he is seeing God face to face. Dinah M. Anderson. Dinah grew up at Ascension. Her mother was Marcelina Barber who immigrated from the Philippines and was one of the earliest members of Ascension Church. Dinah's sister is Frida Bancroft, who also is a member here, and we certainly keep Frida in our prayers as she recovers from surgery. Dinah has now ascended to the heavens. Marguerite Murray. Marguerite loved all of God's creatures, especially the four-legged furry ones. She loved watermelon. She loved candy. She loved root beer. She loved fireworks, scary movies, roller coasters, and loud thunderstorms. She was an amazing cook and baker and enjoyed preparing meals for those she loved. She even provided peanut butter for the squirrels to get them through harsh winters. Some years back, when she lived in Bayview, she made sandwiches for the homeless people who were going through her alley, looking for scraps and aluminum cans. If she saw a little old lady waiting for a bus in the heat or cold, she'd pull right over and offer a ride. This was Marguerite. She was the daughter of Sarah and Don Doyle. Alex Mijo Gamez, Jr. Alex was a big man with a big heart, big faith, and a big sense of humor. Using his name, A stands for always there. Loyal, dedicated, available for his family, co-workers, and friends, always. L is for lighten up. Alex invented laid back. He was known for making everyone laugh. E is for expressing love. Since Alex so generously spread the love God put in his heart, love circled back to bless him during his brief battle with cancer, surrounding him to the end is for Christ. Alex's faith gifted him 
with 28 years of sobriety and gave him a strong sense of God's time and purposes in everything, including his dying. Now, he's making the angels laugh in the presence of God. Richard Allen Lindstrom. Richard loved to write poems and share them with his family, and so to honor him, we hear this poem that he wrote. It's called, For My Great Grandchild. <clears throat> My heart is already full of love for this girl or boy who will bring me happiness and many days of joy. As waiting days go by, I can see the child in my sleep. I hear him as he cries or coos, should the child wake and start to peep. Soon the waiting time will be over, and soon the child will be here. God loves the children every day, so give out a great big cheer. Norman Elwood Bud McConnelly Jr. Bud proudly served in the U.S. Marine Corps during the Vietnam War. He made a career working for the American Red Cross where he retired after 33 years of service and while there served as the chapter executive for 23 years. Bud was a devoted member and past president of Ascension where he started our cancer support group. He served on the City Cemetery Commission for Prairie Home. He was the president of the Red Cross Retiree Association and, Ameri and a member of the American Legion. He was an advocate for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Bud was a member of the Wisconsin Veterans War Memorial, the Milwaukee's Food Program Board, and the Rotary. Bud enjoyed reading, biking, playing guitar, and singing folk music. But he was most passionate about spending time with his family, especially his grandchildren. Orville Madsen. Orville was a simple man, straightforward in his living. He never wanted the spotlight to be on him. His funeral was a very simple but meaningful graveside of thanks for his life. This brought comfort to his children and grandchildren as they commended him to God's eternal grace. Pearl Ethel Krecklow. Jesus said the kingdom was like a man selling everything to buy a pearl. Pearl Krecklow lived a simple life, enjoying her four children and 16 grand and great-grandchildren, who called her Gigi. She enjoyed her games, cards, and the lottery, her soap operas, which she recorded while she was watching, just in case she got interrupted. Her dinners out were enjoyed with family and friends and her longtime membership at Ascension. By faith, she knew that in Christ she was bound for glory. Scripture says, all the gates are made of pearl. Clayton John Clay Klotz. Scripture says we have the treasure of Christ in common clay jars, as in clay clots. C-L-A-Y-T-O-N. C is for communion. His love for Holy Communion marked Clay's whole life. It was his last request. L is for living with hope. Optimism marked Clay's faith life. When his pastors asked him, how are you? Clay had one response, fantastic, pastor. A, affirmation. While known for speaking his mind, Clay was known more for wonderfully affirming his wife, his church, pastors, choirs, music, and me. 
why. Yes, yes, I'll be assistant Sunday school superintendent to Renee for 25 years. Yes, I'll be the director of properties. Yes, I'll be on council. Yes, I'll get the Christmas tree for church. And yes, I'll build beautiful chancel furniture. T and O are for tradition and order. Clay loved the tradition of the hymns and liturgy and keeping God's house and his home in good order. And N is for now. If it's worth doing, do it now. When he knew it was time to go, he was so ready. And so God said, my house will be your home forever. 